morning. My name is Debbie Allen, and I'm a woman of power. You know who told me that? Edwin Gaines. I'm also a master prosperity teacher and a licensed teacher through Unity. So I thought about this today as I was driving in here when uh, Mark had called and said, you know, would you come and speak? And he said, you pick your topic. I thought, well, my favorite topic is prosperity, so I'll go there. And then as the two weeks has passed, the government has shut down and all the money seems to have dried up. And yet, miraculously, overnight, they found a way to budget it, you know, just write more money into the banks and all of this. And I thought, boy, <laughs> I wish the government, I wish our senators and our congressmen were sitting here today to hear Edwin's story of prosperity, because they really need it. And, you know, when you think prosperity, a lot of people, when you say prosperity, the first thing they think about is money. Prosperity has nothing to do with money. In fact, Webster's Dictionary tells us, prosperity is the condition of being successful, thriving, and prosperous. I didn't hear anything about money there. Catherine Ponder, who is one of our icons of prosperity, says, you are prosperous to the degree, to the degree that you are experiencing peace, health, and plenty in your world. I still didn't hear anything about money. Do you know why? God didn't invent money. God, God didn't create money. Man created money as a way to easily exchange for goods that he needed. So when we pray and we ask for money, God's up going, hmm, they want a piece of paper? <laughs> why, why do they want a piece of paper? So, you know, it's, it's not about the money. Prosperity is so much more than money. And, and I think the reason that so many of us have has trouble and struggles with not having all the prosperity that we want in our lives. It, it'll come clear as we go through these four spiritual laws that Edwin talks about. But Richard McDesey, who's uh, our music coordinator at the, at the home office, has this wonderful song, says, I'm willing, ready, and worthy. And in the chorus, or in the words of the song, he talks about a man who goes to heaven, and he has this tour. And the, the, he opens the door to this room, and there's everything you could possibly imagine in this room. And he turns around, and he says, what is all this? And he said, it's all the things that man for, forgot to ask for or forgot to accept. And so I want to talk to you about some of the blocks, some of the reasons that your prosperity may not come be coming to you. And what I found, I went and took Edwin's training. And when you do that, she makes you create your own workshop and then you have to present it to her. Well, I decided I was going to take my workshop to my home church. Let me tell you, that's a big mistake. <laughs> because your home church knows you and loves you as you are, and then when you stand up and try and teach them something like you're better than them, or that's the state they come at you from, they'll shut you down. So as I was looking over the chapters, Edwin, she likes to start with those big fish first. She started talking about tithing. And I thought, man, if I go in there and I start talking about tithing, the first 15 minute break I give them, they're gone. They're not going to come back. So I sat down and I spent time with a book and I called Edwin and I said, would you care if I move the chapters around? She said, no. She said, you do whatever you want. She said, it's the message that's in it that you want to work with. She says, tell me what you're thinking about. So I told her about my home church and all this. And I said, you know, the thing that I know from my home church, I said, they've had struggles over the years. I mean, that church starts growing up so big. And it's in Joplin. And it's in the real center of a new age phenomenon around there. And, and what happens is because unity is so open and so loving, the new age starts to float in. And then the messages start getting muddled. And then they'll get a spiritual leader or a, a good unity minister in there who says, OK, this is unity, this is not. And then the church splits. And usually, the ones who have the money are the ones who leave because they want things their way. That's not the way it is. You know, this is, this is unity, and this is not. It's not that we don't say we can't look at these things, but this is not what's going to be taught from the pulpit. So, you know, there's been a lot of squabbles. They've lost several ministers and, you know, battles in the church. You know, it's church. It's going to happen. But I told Edwin, I said, you know, the one thing I know about that church, I said, nobody has ever came in and talked to them much about forgiveness, about forgiving each other, forgiving themselves, forgiving whatever happened. 
And she said, okay. She said, go with it. So I started thinking about the forgiveness and the two things that, that really I needed to forgive, I needed to work on. And then I went back to my science years. Quantum physics says that two things cannot habitat the same space at the same time. It's true about thoughts, too. You cannot focus on two thoughts at the same time. So if you're holding a thought of unforgiveness, you can't have your eyes open to the prosperity and the goodness that God's going to send you. And that's, that's something that it's so easy. You know, driving over here this morning, I'm driving along and there's three lanes of highway and I'm in the middle lane and this truck, semi truck on this side, he starts coming over. So what did I do? I start coming over except there's another semi coming up behind me and he's blowing his horn. And my mind went, no, bless them both. It's Sunday morning. They're trying to get home to their families. And it shifted my consciousness in that moment to forgive both of them. It wasn't anybody's fault. The road just was a little narrower there or what. I don't know, but you know, it's that point of forgiving. But forgiveness is not that thing that you can say, it's done. No, no. <laughs> John Gray, he wrote a book called Men Are From Mars or Women For Venus. And there's a chapter in there he calls the trash can theory. And when we are in a space mentally, emotionally, and spiritually that we can't handle something, we're allowed to put it in this trash can over here and put the lid on it. And then we go on and we learn and we grow and all of a sudden we're better. But that trash can's still over there and all of a sudden the lid flies off and something comes out and you say, where did that come from? I thought I was done with that. No, you weren't done with it. You just put it in the trash can for a while. And you have to take the trash out. You have to work with it. You have to get past that piece of forgiveness. And the sad part about it is, for most of us, is we don't even realize all the things that we need to forgive. We don't rem consciously think about all those times that we've, as Edwin put it, put someone out of our heart. Now, Edwin has a practice every night before she goes to bed. And she gets out a pencil and piece of paper and says, OK, God, who have I put out of my heart today? And she said, I go back through my whole day looking at who I got aggravated because they cut me off in traffic, or why I got in a line that was express line and the woman ahead of me had 40 items. She said, you know, all those little daily things that happen to us, and they add to the tension within our body, which allows us to close our eyes and not be aware of what the prosperity is comes. Now, what if that woman has those 40 items ahead of you, and you don't say anything, you go ahead and let her check out, you walk up to the counter, and all of a sudden, the bells and whistle goes off, and you're the 5,000th customer, and you win a prize. All of a sudden, those 40 items that she had don't seem so bad at all. So you know, forgiveness is one of those things you always have to work with. But I heard a quote once that I absolutely loved. It said, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. The bottom line is, forgiveness is to give over. It's to give up. Because I've had many times that I've been holding something against someone, and they didn't even know I was doing it. One of my best friends in Joplin made an offhanded statement one day that I took the wrong way, and I didn't say anything to her. It's just every time I was around her, I had this tension, this aggravation with her. And finally, she looked at me one day, and she says, Debbie, she said, what is up with you? She said, I feel this energy from you every time we're together. And I said, well, Pat, what you said that day, oh, well, that's not the way I meant it. I meant it this way. Oh, and actually, the way she meant it was compliment. And yet, I was holding a space of unforgiveness. And so it's one of those things that we need to work with daily, of looking at all the aspects of our lives, of the things that we need to, to forgive, and then let go. I have a plaque in my office, it's a little poem, and I can't ever remember it word for word, but it's the basis of, as children, we take our broken toys to God, or we take our broken toys to our parents, and we expect them to fix it. So I took my broken life to God for him to fix. And I stood, and I hummed, and I hawed, and I watched, and I looked, and all this, and then I grew angry, and I said, God, why are you so slow? And God said, my child, 
who never did let go. And that is what you have to do. It is not an easy thing to do. But when you have those moments of something that happened years ago, ask yourself, is it serving me or this person in this moment for me to hold this tension, for me to hold this anxiety? Because it's not doing anything to them. You drank the poison. Now, Ed Wayne, as I said, Ed Wayne went first. Her first was the, to go to tithing. And I said, no, I'm not going to go there yet. So then she says, sets goals. And I said, well, you know, goals are great. But how can I set a goal if I don't know who I am or what I should be setting goals about? She said, OK, where do you want to go next? I said, I want to go to purpose. What is my purpose? And Edwin tells us in the book that she <laughs> had many experiences of trying to figure out what her purpose was. But she says you should stop and think about what really speaks to you. Have you ever had this nagging thing in the back of your head that could kind of keep you unhappy, but you don't know what it is, but it's kind of like singing, you know? We had some great singers up here this morning, and I'm sure at some time in their life they've felt that little voice in the back of your head saying, you know, you need to sing, you need to sing. So it, with purpose, you need to look at it and make sure it's something that you're going to enjoy, that's going to be fun. And more than anything, with your purpose, ask yourself in everything that you do, whatever you're in, what is my purpose for being here? Why am I doing this? Am I doing it for service? Or am I doing it for my own ego? Am I doing it to feed me, to make me feel better? Because that's not your purpose. And <laughs> it kind of reminds me of my son several years ago came to me, and he wanted to get a dog. And I said, OK. He found this dog, and he said, this is the dog I, I want, I'm going to get, Mom. What do you think? And I said, is that dog the kind of dog I think it is? He goes, yeah, Mom. He said, it's a pit bull. Well, you know, we all hear those rumors and stories about pit bulls. So I kind of clenched my fist, and I said, OK, you have to be the responsible owner. Your purpose is to prove to me that a pit bull is not this mean, vicious animal I keep hearing about on the news. So he did a lot of research. And one of the shows he watched on TV all the time was Cesar Romano of the Dog Whisperer. And he talks about a pit bull being a pack animal and that they need a good alpha leader. And without an alpha leader, they try and lead, and they don't know how. Now, I can tell you from experience, my son had moved somewhere that he thought he was allowed to have this pit bull. And he found out almost a year later he couldn't. So now I have Lucy. And I had to remember that I have to be alpha with Lucy because she can't be loud a leader. She doesn't know how. And it's a much the same way with your ego. Your ego needs to have a good alpha leader. That alpha leader spirit, God, whatever, whatever name you put on it. And if you're working from a place that your ego is being led and driven by spirit, then you're OK. But if you take it to where it's ego of, I am better than this one, I know more than this one, that's, that's not being led by spirit. Because spirit never places that judgment of better than or less than. Spirit just is. It just is love. And so it's, it's kind of challenging at times when you look at that and say, what is my purpose? What is it I really want to do? I was in Joplin and was the church secretary for four years. I thought I was perfectly fine there. I thought that was where I was going to spend the rest of my life. I thought that was my purpose. We lost our minister. And the minister was coming down, just like you guys have here, come down from Kansas City. And I'd worked a lot of workshops and, and uh, Sunday talks and stuff with her. And she said to me one day, she said, Debbie, my assistant has just gave me two-week notice. I want you to apply. Linda, are you kidding? I've lived in Joplin for 42 years. I can't just give up everything. She says, Debbie, just, just pray about it. See what it is. And I knew at the time that the job I was in hadn't been really fulfilling. But it was a paycheck. And it was a good paycheck. And I was raising a child. And I thought, you know, I can't I'll, I'll pray about it. So my excuse to her was, Linda, I can't do this simply for the fact I'd have to sell my house. And it's not a good time to sell. She said, Debbie, if you just go into prayer and say God's will, not mine, but thine, see what happens. So about a week and a half later, 
knock, came on my back door and opened the back door. And there's a friend of mine that I had, hadn't seen in four or five years that had been around when I bought this old house and had helped us do a lot of the repairs on it. So Ted and I were talking about the house and what all had been going on in my life and his life and all this. And, and I said, yeah, I've been asked to apply for a job in Kansas City at the home office. And I said, you know, to me, that's just, wow, being at the home office, being at the heart of unity. And he said, well, what's stopping you? I said, Ted, I'd have to sell this house. And I said, it's not a seller's market right now. The money is low. He said, it's sold. I said, well, thanks for the affirmation. Now bring me the buyer. He reached in his back pocket and wrote me a check for $1,000. He said, will that be good enough for a down payment? And that's when you have to say, okay, God, I get it. My purpose is not to stay here in Joplin. My purpose is to go to the home office and work there and to serve all of the unity movement. And that's where my heart has been. That's been my purpose, is to, to be there. I've worked in radio media. I've worked in development. I've worked in marketing. I've worked in communications. And right now, I'm the manager of the Unity Identity Program. That's our new branding program where we're working to get a look that people can easily recognize and make unity come up to being the movement that Charles, intended, Charles and Myrtle intended to be. You know, right now, when I was in the radio and the media department, so many people would call and say, why doesn't unity do like the, the Methodist and the, and the Mormons and do TV? I said, how do you describe a thousand churches that don't look alike, don't sound alike, don't even have unity in their names? How do you do that? And nobody could answer that question. So for all these years, we've struggled with that. And then two years ago, we partnered with Unity Village. And we started the, the, a branding program. And both the school now and Unity Worldwide Ministries are carrying the same logo. And right now, I have 196 ministries carrying that logo. And I look at that, and I'm like, wow, my purpose was to come here and support this movement into standing up and, and saying, hey, here we are. Because I tell you, the other faiths have looked at us and say, hey, they got something. If you don't believe me, listen to Joel Osteen. He gives our message every Sunday. So, you know, it's time to look at what is your purpose? What is it God's calling you to do? Because, you know, anytime you have a desire, that's just God knocking on your heart. Helps you take a lid off. <laughs> so as I went on laying out my workshop, Edwin says, well, are you going to do tithing now? And I said, no, I'm going to go to goals. I already know what my purpose is, so what are my goals? You know, she's still kind of frowning at me. She's thinking I'm going to sidestep a bit on tithing. And so I looked at it, and I said, OK. If I've done my forgiveness, and if I know what my purpose is, what good are either one of those if I don't set some goals with my purpose, the things I want to ac accomplish? And you might say, what does that have to do with prosperity? It directs your faith. When you know who you are, when you know what your purpose is, you start clearing out and you start focusing on the things that is yours to do. And when you set tangible goals, not just, oh, one of these days I'm going to do this, but actually set down a tangible goal and say, I am going to do this. And be accountable to yourself to getting it done. Then you've directed faith. And when you've got faith directed and you are committed to what it is, there is no way that the windows of heaven are not going to fly open and everything you ever needed is going to come your way. There's been a lot of challenges in my life. And uh, one of them was I had cancer. And I went, spent off and on five times in the hospital. And the last time I was in, I was really struggling. I had used up all my savings. I had used up all of my sick leave. I had used up everything. And I'm laying in the hospital two weeks before Thanksgiving. And I don't have a clue how I'm going to pay the bills for December. And, and I'm struggling with it, and I'm thinking, OK, I could go to my sister and maybe borrow $1,000 here. I could, I could go over here and do this, or I guess I could file for welfare. And I was getting so wound up in it. And then I could kind of hear Edwin in the back of my head. Oh, 
you're going to go back and go through all your stuff again, aren't you? That you're not deserving, you're not worthy, that God's not going to take care of you, that you're not as good as the birds of the, of the sky. And at that moment, I realized what I had to do was go back to my favorite poem. I had to let go and let God. So I, laying in that bed, and I've got so much morphine in me, I can't hardly talk. I said, okay, God, I get it. This is yours, and you're going to have to deal with it, because I just can't. It isn't in me to do. It's up to you. And they had me on monitors and stuff. My heart rate started going up, and this started going off and all that. And the nurses kept coming in, wanting to give me more and more. I said, just leave me alone. And it just so happened, the room of the hospital I was in was a corner room. It had windows on two sides. And I can see, I'm on the sixth floor, so I can see all over Overland Park, Kansas. And I hate the sensation of falling. And I felt like I was falling. And I mean, I just, I struggled with it. For four hours, I struggled with it. And, and I was going through all my unity affirmations and all this and all this, and kept trying to say, you know, just let go, let go, let go. And finally, I hit a point that I said, okay, my goal, what was my goal in accepting the challenge of cancer? My goal was to put new ends to old tapes in my family, because cancer was a death sentence in my family. And if that was my goal, why am I worrying about my finances? Because ending that, that train of thought that cancer is a killer is killing my dreams. It's killing my purpose. It's time for me to say, okay, God, I trust. You told me that I didn't have to lose my leg because the doctors wanted one to amputate and I wouldn't go there. I said, I am going to walk out of this. This is my goal. I'm going to walk out of this. I'm going to be fine. I'm going to go back to doing what I need to be doing. I'm going to go wherever you tell me to go. I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. And all of a sudden, I felt this sense of peace come over me. I knew what my goal was. I knew what my purpose was. And I had finally forgiven myself all these lackings that I was thought I had because I didn't have the money and I didn't know where it was going to come from and I was going to be a beggar and a pulper. And I, sit, I laid there for about five or ten minutes and all of a sudden I hear this voice at the door. Glenn Mosley was the CEO of, of Unity Worldwide Ministries at the time and he always called me Debbie Sue. Comes in there he says, Debbie Sue, how are we tonight? I said, Glenn, I'm not good. I said, I'm, I'm really in a bad space. So what does he do? This, you know, very sophisticated ministry. He just crawls up in bed with me, and he starts praying. And we prayed, and we prayed, and we went on for about 30 minutes. Nurses came to the door, and they turned around and went back out. <laughs> Never said a word. This man's up on my bed. He's got his hands on my knee, and he's praying. They just come up to go back out. And so he gets through praying, and we sit there, and he goes, Hey, Debbie, you said, have you got your purse here? And I said, Yeah, Glenn, I do. And he said, well, I need a deposit slip from you before I leave here today. The staff took up a collection. Now, the staff of the home office, you're only talking about 25 people. But, you know, anything was better than nothing in that moment. So he takes out this manila envelope, and he lays it on the thing, and I opened it, and I dumped it out. And, of course, there's all these bills and quarters and all this, and we added all that up, and it was $297. And I'm going, okay, there's the utility bills for the month. And... There was two envelopes. There was a white one and a manila one. Well, I went to grab for the manila one. He goes, now open the white one first. And I opened it up. And the leadership, the five vice presidents of the home office, had told the staff that they personally would match everything the staff collected. So I had six checks for $60 a piece, $300. That was my rent. All right, I'm going to make it. It's going to be OK. And your tears are starting to come down my eyes. And Glenn's just grinning, and he says, open the other one now. And it was a check from the field, from all the Unity's ministries Glenn had put out that I was in a bad space. And he needed the field's permission, because we don't do anything from the home office. Everything has to come from the field. He said, is, is the field willing to support her as she goes through this healing? And I opened the envelope, and it was a $1,000 check and a note that said, your coworkers have been allowed to give you vacation until you can come back to work. So my coworkers had given up time that they had earned to give me a paycheck. And I went, OK, I get it. 
I get it. Look at that prosperity. Look at that. And uh, I, went, I went back to work, went, went back between pay periods. So I went back to the accountant at the end of the pay period and I said, okay, these are the hours I've worked. I don't know if there's anything left in that fund, but you know, if I get a full paycheck, that'd be nice. But if not, it's okay. God's going to take care of me. So she said, well, let me look and I'll call you. She called me about 45 minutes later. She said, Debbie, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? She said, after I take the hours out of that account and put on there so you have a full check, there's 30 minutes left in that account. That 30 minutes, folks, is still there. <laughs> I leave it there to remind me that God is my source. And there are all kinds of channels. And if I just stay clear of what my purpose is and set the goals working towards that purpose, the whole universe is going to just conspire to give me and everything I want and need. I need not worry. And that's not an easy thing to do. So, you know, I got those three points crossed. And Edwin says, okay, now you got to do it. Now you got to, now you got to touch that tithing piece. I keep stopping my own flow. <laughs> so, Edwin is one that she believes because the way she did it is she took it right off the top. 10% quit, just damn. And, you know, for a lot of people, that's a hard place to be. When you're looking at your paycheck and not sure you're going to pay your whole bills, to take 10% of it and set aside. Because she kept saying, tithing is the law, tithing is the law. And at the time, I was reading Eric Butterworth's Spiritual Economics. And I happen to agree with Eric and not Edwin. <laughs> Eric says that tithing is not the law. Tithing is nothing but a discipline. The law is the law of giving and receiving. And nowhere in the Bible does it say the law is receiving and giving. No, it is giving and receiving. And in that moment, I knew out of that first paycheck I got that I had to add up the money and the hours that everybody gave me. And I had to give it. Because he'd already proved, God had already proved to me once he was going to make everything okay. But I had to do my part. I had to open those doors of flow and take that money and give it. And I'll tell you, every time I have had an ex a, a amount of money come into my life, I've made sure that I didn't stop that flow. Because that's what it's all about. It's giving and receiving. When you're in that space of knowing your purpose, setting your goals, and both of those are your giving of yourself, then you will receive everything you need to do to accomplish that. It, it's a clear vision just to be able to say, I understand that. Now, am I there every moment of every day? No, I live in the same world you guys do. I listen to the news and I hear the government shut down. And I wonder how long that's going to take to trickle down to me. <laughs> but it doesn't have to. If we all hold the consciousness, we can change the prosperity consciousness of this country. If we get it that the giving is what comes first, not with our hands out, but with, with just honest God giving. There's a phrase I heard from Michael Rice when the Unity did their standard blessing of the offering. He says, you guys are forgetting a line. At the end of it, he said, as I open my hand to give, I open my heart to receive. And so if, if you don't get anything else from my talk today, I would just ask that you stop and take a few minutes to look without the jaded eyes of unforgiveness without the lazy eyes of non-purpose and non-commitment, about the I'll do it tomorrow attitude of setting goals, and look at the prosperity that sits around you every moment of every day. It's there, folks. All those gifts are piled up just waiting for us to ask. Now, I went over Edwin's book in, in a very short time. And I encourage you, any of you who haven't read the book, to read it. Now, I created my workshop, and then I took it to my home church. I had four people show up. 
kind of hurt the ego. <laughs> yeah. And so I just kind of put it away on a shelf and left it. A few months later, Greg Barrett, who was in one of the largest unity churches in Warren, Michigan, called me and he said, I'm looking for a new prosperity program. He said, I have all the keys to the kingdom. And, and we know about our times, our talents, and our treasures. He said, I need something new. He said, have you read it? I asked him, have you read Edwin's book? He says, yes, but I need a program. I need something. I don't have time. I said, tell you what, Greg. I said, I've put together a program based on her book. And I said, I need feedback. I haven't. I used it once, and I wasn't successful. I need you to tell me. He said, well, OK, how much do you want for it? I said, I'm going to give it to you if you just promise to give me feedback. He said, I can do that. So I sent him everything. A few weeks later, Connie is our receptionist. She called me and she says, Debbie, you've got to come down. I've got a check for you. Well, it was right before Christmas. I thought it was my reimbursement where I bought stuff for the Christmas party. And he went down and she handed me a check. And it was a check from that church for $2,934.74. Did I get my feedback? Of course, being a human, I doubted it. I ran upstairs and called Greg and I said, are you sure about this? <laughs> I said, are you sure this isn't coming into the home office? He said, no, they got one the same size. He said, Debbie, he said, I, had, he said, I read that book, but I never got it to the depth of the studies that he said that you brought forth or the ways for me to put it, in my, put it in my life. He said, I've got three groups doing that workshop. I got one in the daytime, one in the evening. And he said, my YOUers are doing it. So then within a year, we put together a program for the ministries called Thriving in Unity. And the woman who wrote it said, I'm not a prosperity teacher. So I gave her, I gave to the movement my workshop. I'm going to leave this notebook here with you. This is the whole piece. I encourage you to come together as a group and go through this and go in much deeper levels than what I covered here today in the talk. This is, this is a great piece to figure out where you're at. And I can tell you, it's the best thing that ever happened in my life. So I thank God and I thank Aunt Wade. Thank you.